Hello and welcome to Western University's webinar with Dr. Philip Howard on more than a diverse reading list, challenging an anti-Black pedagogy. This event is hosted by Western Center for Teaching and Learning in support from Western's Office of the President. Please note there is closed caption live transcript available today. Just click on CC live transcript at the bottom of your screen. My name is Aisha Huck and I'm the Acting Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. Each spring, our center hosts a conference on pedagogy to bring together a community of instructors and reflect on promising practices. This year, I'm delighted to extend our keynote with Dr. Howard to a national audience. As we gather in this virtual space today for the purpose of reflecting on and resisting the racist and colonial underpinnings of higher education systems, I want to take a moment and ground us in relation to the land. I know we're joining from across Turtle Island today, but I want to acknowledge that the land I'm joining this webinar from and on which Western University is situated is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Ottawandaran peoples, on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Long before settlers renamed this place London after the Thames River in England, the Deshgan Zibi, or Antler River, as the Anishinaabe know it, was a tributary channel and home for the Indigenous nations who continue to be the original peoples to this place. Reciprocity and relationality with the land and with each other is at the heart of anti-racist and anti-colonial efforts as I understand them. I'd like to turn the floor to Western's acting provost, Dr. Sarah Pritchard, to say a few words to frame today's conversation. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, can you hear me? Can people hear me? I hope. Yeah, welcome everybody to this, uh, this event and thank you to the organizers and thank you to our guest speaker for agreeing to participate. The, we are living in extraordinary times uh, between the pandemic, the economic upheaval, and of course our confrontation of our racist past and present has been the story of our last, um, well, for many years, but particularly the last year. At Western, we have had to confront concerns about black racism, initially as uh, as a community that had agreed to host the Congress last year, and Black racism was a, a key, going to be a key part of that program. But in addition, we had events happen on campus, and Western initiated an anti-racism uh, uh, work task force about 18 months ago that reported just about one year ago, and by, by chance really coincided with the murder of George Floyd. And this, confront, this confrontation of us as a community, and indeed the world, uh, I would say, with trying to deal with black racism and the elevation of the discussion has been an extremely important one. And I think a very enriching one for our academic community. We have initiated at Western a number of uh, number of things, uh, including the recruitment of additional people to counsel us on racism. We are investing in curriculum renewal that will address uh, black racism and colonialism in, in particular. And we're doing that um, with a broad part of our community, our racialized community, our indigenous community who share with us uh, concerns about the, our colonial history and the need, uh, the great need for work that we all have in this regard. So I'm really delighted that uh, the, this event is occurring today. We've opened it uh, to a, a, an audience uh, across the country, a very broad participation, including you know, those of you who are wholly committed to teaching, but far beyond that, uh, presidents, vice presidents, uh, staff, students uh, from various universities and colleges across the country have uh, registered to participate in today's discussion. So I really thank everybody for your participation. I thank the organizers. This is an extremely important and contemporary problem where we need to ourselves to reflect 
and to take stock and then to take action uh, to address the, the issues that are being raised. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back to Aisha uh, to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Dr. Pritchard. So I have three important comments about logistics before I introduce Dr. Howard. First, today's keynote is being recorded and will be available to attendees. The session today ends at 12.15 and we will have lots of time for questions. So please post your questions during and right after Dr. Philip um, Howard's talk in the Q&A feature. For anyone joining from Western University, please note that we have two additional sessions for you this afternoon because it's part of an entire day long event. Um, and those reminders will also be posted for you in the chat. Dr. Philip Howard is an assistant professor in the Department of Integrated Studies in Education at McGill University. He works in the areas of Black Canadian studies and anti colonial studies in education, and his interests are in the ways in which relations of race and anti-Blackness mediate the ways we come to know ourselves, create community, and exercise agency in the Canadian settler colonial context. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard. And thank you, Aisha, for that uh, introduction. And good morning, everyone. I would like to begin this morning by thanking the organizers of this talk at Western University. I would particularly like to thank Aisha Hawk for extending the invitation. I am an education scholar. I research and teach in a faculty of education. And often what we do as education scholars is narrowly interpreted as having to do only with schools and schooling and with preparing people to be classroom teachers. I like to think that what we do is broader than this. I read and write not only in the areas of schooling research, but also more broadly to consider the contexts and consequences of knowledge production. I begin with this in order to frame expectations about what I might do today through this keynote. I raise it because the more narrow vision of what it is that someone like me is supposed to do often informs the not uncommon situation in which sincere students I teach particularly pre-service students whose student teaching practicum might be looming, will earnestly pose questions that sound a bit like, what does this have to do with teaching? And or, can you just give me some good teaching strategies that I can use in my classroom tomorrow? Over my years of teaching, I have become better at preempting these questions by carefully framing the work and drawing direct connections to their classroom practice. Nevertheless, while I understand the urgency of these student requests, I have always experienced them as an interruption of the kind of conversations that might truly be transformative. The call for implementation ready strategies is a call to just get on with it. It suspends the kind of engagement that might disrupt the status quo educational violence that black students experience, that might dismantle a world constituted by this violence, and that might build another in its place that refuses this violence. The current historical moment is that of the COVID-19 pandemic, which along with the extra legal assassination of George Floyd last year, has served to highlight the centuries long pandemic of violence that routinely produces black death, whether sudden and episodic or protracted and chronic. This moment presents possibilities. Many institutions and perhaps universities in particular have made statements against anti-black racism. It is a new moment if we consider the specific details and timing and what is perhaps promising in this moment is the way in which echoes of a particular kind of radical thought, of black thought, have emerged in the mainstream. I mean, who would have foreseen a year and a half ago this level of circulation in mainstream and social media of terms like anti-black racism and serious attention to calls to abolish police? 
Yet in so many other ways, some of us are saying we have been here before. We know that whatever opening this moment represents is unlikely to be permanent. I don't think it's pessimistic to expect that following the institutional and societal declarations that we have seen, there will be a countercurrent that seeks to ensure as little change to the status quo as possible. This backlash will look like efforts to neutralize and absorb the rabbit radical potential of the moment by co-opting its language and redefining its core concepts. And of course, we have begun to see this already. It will also happen through demands similar to those of my students that insist we offer up easily digestible actions we can implement immediately while refusing to take on the challenge to change the structures that, should they remain, doom our action to failure. And don't get me wrong, there is action that we can and must take immediately. I'll get to some of this later. However, this action must be able to articulate what it is that it seeks to change, and it cannot be incorporated within conditions dedicated to its negation. As I thought about what I might say today then, it is these ideas that caused me to entitle the talk more than a diverse reading list, where the reading list, a list itself, is metonym for a list of strategies, a checklist, if you will, of easy interventions that would appease our itch to take action, any action, so that it cannot be said that we did nothing. I hope that what I share here today will advance a particular framing of the issues and that it will offer us some handles that we might hold on to to pursue a meaningful kind of change to work at what I am calling challenging an anti-Black pedagogy, the subtitle I have chosen for this talk. So what might I mean by an anti-Black pedagogy? Let us first examine the notion of anti-Blackness. And to do that, I wish to return to the land acknowledgement with which we began. These acknowledgements, which for many have become nothing more than a formality, to me, serve to situate us politically in any conversation that we have on this land. I want to remind myself and others whenever I speak that in this geopolitical space known as Canada, we are embroiled in a genocidal settler colonial project that is by definition ongoing. I, for example, speak from the unceded lands, which is to say lands stolen from the Ghanaian Gahaga. And this talk is hosted by the lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunepoak, and Adawandaran peoples. I also remind us that Black people and Indigenous people have historically been enslaved on these lands and together remain subject to gratuitous violence here. These are not curious facts of history. Rather, if I were to focus in now on anti-Blackness, they define the terms of our existence in Canada today, an expression of Cydia Hartman's now iconic notion of the afterlife of slavery. Hartman writes in her 2007 book, Lose Your Mother, quote, if slavery persists as an issue in the political life of Black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of a too long memory, but because Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by a racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery. Skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration, and impoverishment." End of quote. The history, however erased of slavery in Canada, and more importantly, Canada's integral interconnections with the Atlantic world through the transatlantic slave trade make this observation as true here 
as it is in the United States context about which Hartman was speaking. In making this observation, Hartman speaks alongside scholars such as Sylvia Winter in a 1994 Black Studies Manifesto and others such as Cedric Robinson, Frank Willerson III, Rinaldo Walcott, and numerous others that what undergirded slavery and what endures in the present as slavery's afterlife is an ontology whereby not just whiteness, but also that entire sociogenic category of the human is constructed in such a way that blackness is its antithesis. Indeed, the coherence of this notion of the human depends upon maintaining blackness as its outside. And if blackness is humanity's outside, then it is also the outside of those social, political, and institutional categories associated with it, including such constructs as community and of particular relevance to my talk today, the university. This afterlife of slavery is what I shall refer to from this point by the more familiar term, anti-Blackness. And in naming anti-Blackness, I want to take an aside here to distinguish it in my usage from a more confusing term, that is, anti-Black racism, which suggests a broader generalized concept of racism that is qualified by the prefix anti-Black simply to refer to its object rather than its essence. Anti-Blackness, as I use it here, instead seeks to highlight the ontological dimensions of anti-Blackness and the uniqueness of its formations. So that's the anti-Blackness part of the anti-Black pedagogy. But what about the pedagogy part? If you were to look up pedagogy in intro education texts or on the internet, one might come up with something to this effect. Curriculum is what you teach, while pedagogy is how you teach it. I'm not convinced that this simplistic division holds when we are talking about broader contexts of knowledge production. My notion of an anti-Black pedagogy, therefore, includes both what we come to know and how we come to know it. I also like to capture the concept of pedagogy in a variation of a saying that school teachers often use with their students, which is everything speaks. Pedagogy might be captured in the adage, in the adage everything teaches. In other words, what we come to know about ourselves, our world, is conveyed through much more than what takes place in a classroom, but also through the ways that the spaces in which classrooms are found are organized. Another way of saying this in education speak is that in addition to, in addition to the official curriculum represented in our course outlines and so on, our concept of pedagogy must also account for the existence of the hidden curriculum that which is implicitly taught, as well as the null curriculum, that which is simply not said and not addressed, and therefore, by its absence, speaks. This anti-Blackness, both historically and in the present, constitutes the university, as scholars like Craig Wilder and Rosalind Hampton have determined in different geographical contexts. Our academic institutions are deeply complicit in anti-Black histories. I have mentioned that McGill University, the institution at which I am based, was made possible through the proceeds from the enslavement of Black and Indigenous people in Canada and abroad. And I hope I am not being a bad guest to establish common ground by acknowledging that Western has its own distinct history of anti-Blackness and the production of anti-Black knowledge. Indeed, McGill and Western are not exceptions. Anti-Blackness is the condition of possibility of all universities in Canada, if the argument that I am making holds about the constitution of the university as associated with an anti-Black notion of the human. 
Bringing these ideas together then, an anti-Black pedagogy speaks to the multiple means by which the university as we know it gets produced and reproduced by making Blackness its outside. An anti-Black pedagogy in the specific context of the university refers to the ways that the university comes to know itself as the university through mechanisms that are antagonistic to Black life and Black flourishing. And of course, when I say the university comes to know itself, I really mean that those of us who are a part of it are coming to know ourselves as in, of, through, in opposition to, or even as the university against the foil of Blackness. An anti-Black pedagogy manif manifests in multiple ways in the university. It is manifest in the ways in which the university keeps Black people out, both physically and conceptually, and presumes that we are out of place when we are there. Here we might think about the dismally small proportions of Black students and even more dismal proportions of Black faculty at Canadian universities. We could recite a litany of very recent experiences that are based on this logic. We can think about the racial profiling of Black graduate student Shelby McPhee at the Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences in 2019 held at the University of British Columbia. We can think about the multiple instances in which state and campus police have carded, harassed, and harmed Black students simply for being at the university. I think of Williston Mason and Jamal Boyce at the University of Ottawa, Savoy Williams at the University of British Columbia again, Jordan Afolabi at the University of Windsor, Baba Coyote Fatoba at Simon Fraser University, and the list goes on. I think about the fact that these students should not have to prove their legitimate presence at the university, and also about the fact that it makes absolutely no difference even when they produce student cards, keys to their campus residences or places of employment, letters from supervisors and the like. The unbelonging of Black people at the university is concretized in the ways that Blackness is rendered constant surprise at the university. In my research, participants reported multiple instances in which students and faculty expressed surprise that they were there. One student reported, quote, the first day when we arrived for class, there were only white people. Basically, I was the only Black person. And the prof, when he came in, asked me if I wasn't mistaken. I told him that no, I wasn't mistaken. And I gave him the course number. And he said, yeah, okay. That he just thought that I was mistaken, just like that. I don't know why, but it was me that he asked if I was wrong, if I was in the wrong course, as if, <laughs> but it was a computer course, computer mathematics. So perhaps he was thinking that I wouldn't have the ability to take that course, end quote. These incidents can only be produced through an embedded logic that makes Black people the outside of the university. Drawing here on Catherine McKittrick's analysis of surprise in Canada, I suggest that surprise is a technique that responds to a particular need to represent the university as constitutively Blackless. I'm suggesting that it is an active, if deeply psychically embedded process that occurs because of what is at stake for the university, rather than by casual oversight, a mistaken conviction that Black presence at the Can Canadian university is only recent, or even the actions of a few bad apples. And let us notice that the student I quoted earlier discerns a connection between the presumption of their out of placeness and a presumption of their lack of intelligence. This is the logic that produced the similar experiences of multiple black persons in my study and a storied logic beyond 
in the education literature about blackness in Canada at university. By this logic, the black person visually conjures up ideas of irrationality and unintelligence, that which is, of course, the antithesis of what the university understands itself to be about. Sylvia Winter's analysis of the Sambo figure is helpful in further understanding how blackness as the antithesis, as the antithesis of rational human Western subjectivities is signaled in the white Western imagination by the presentation of the black body. Winter writes, quote, the place of the norm is constituted by and through the definition of certain desired attributes. The most desired attribute was the intellectual faculty. The sign that pointed to its non-possession was blackness of skin, which revealed non-human being. The black exists as the symbolic object constituting the lack, the void of these qualities that have been postulated as the absolute sign of the certainty of being human. That a man, or almost a man, can exist lacking these things sets into play the terror that these attributes can be lost. The black then becomes the symbolic object of this lack, which is designated as the lack of the human." End quote. The stakes around intelligence and blackness are raised at the university in the context of unevenly broadening participation in higher education and where in its normative workings, intelligence is ostensibly the currency reckoned and accumulated as merit or to one's credit as belonging to draw on Harney and Moton. Here, being good enough, ostensibly smart enough to get in and excelling academically once in can potentially be mobilized to supersede social class, socioeconomic, and ethnic identities that might otherwise suggest unbelonging. Thus, the university is engaged transactionally to confer a sense of intelligence and reputation that is defined against Blackness. For ultimately, universities as they currently exist are not simply learning and credentializing spaces in any simplistic understandings of those terms. Rather, they are also spaces through which social subjects craft their subjectivities and wherein identifications such as learned and qualified are always already anti-Black. Against this background, the Black experience of being encountered as surprise can be understood. If Blackness is in fact the antithesis of everything that the university is committed to producing, if that product can only be known in opposition to what Black people are, then Black people cannot properly be a part of the university community. Recalling McKittrick, surprise enables the fundamental rendering of the university as ontologically Blackless, regardless of how long Black people have been a part of the university, and perhaps especially because Black people have been a part of the university in order that the university can go about the essential business of producing that which blackness is not. By this logic, blackness can only ever be surprising when encountered there, and it will excite passions intent on removing it. Anti-Black pedagogy is manifest in how it produces anti-Black knowledge, both by commission and omission. Jaleel Bishop Mustafa, drawing on Cornell West and writing in the US context writes, quote, white supremacy defines itself by convincing Black people that their bodies are ugly, that their intellect is inherently underdeveloped, their culture is less civilized and their future warrants less concern than that of other peoples. The higher education system has helped operate and engineer all of these functions of white supremacy." End quote. For the Canadian context, we add 
that the university has also engineered the erasure of Black people from the state, its history, and from accounts of state violence. And beyond this is the related production of discourses of Canadianness as benevolent, egalitarian, multicultural, welcoming. A participant in one of my research studies speaking to this kind of knowledge said, quote, I think there is a pressure that racialized individuals endure in silence and isolation. I think the pressure is invisible because the discourses we hear are often in conflict with our experience as Black. I think living in an environment and a time where we hear so many discourses about equality, equity, justice, freedom, and so many beautiful values conflicting with racism confuses the way I generally feel about anti-Blackness." End quote. The participant is highlighting the epistemic violence, the kind of gaslighting that the university's knowledge produ production creates. Anti-Black pedagogy is also manifest in the ways that universities keep out Black knowledge. The Canadian University has actively resisted the study of Black life qua Black in Canada, as Peter Hudson and Aaron Kamagisha, Ronaldo Walcott, Idil Abdullahi, and others have all most recently forcefully argued. Universities in Canada have by and large opposed Black people's calls for the creation of Black Studies departments, even when in the wake of global decolonization and civil rights struggles, a generation ago, universities in other parts of the world, like the United States, did so. Few Canadian universities to date have invested in supporting Black studies. It is only within the last maybe three or four years that initiatives of this sort have been achieved at so far only three universities. Outside of such academic structures, Black scholars who take up the study of Black life are scattered across departments and disciplines, while the study of Black life in Canada is taken up in traditional departments, if at all, in ways that misname it and or produce Black people as enigma. The message of this anti-Black pedagogy is that the knowledge of Black people in Canada and Black people's knowledge more generally is not worthwhile knowledge and does not contribute anything unique to existing understandings of the human condition in Canada or beyond. The ways in which the university locates Black people outside of the university, both physically and conceptually then, is in symbiotic relationship with its roles of negating Black knowledge and producing anti-Black knowledge that secure Canadian innocence and places Black people outside of Canada and indeed outside of the human. Finally, the university's anti-Black pedagogy is evident in many of the core principles that define it. In that regard, we need only think about the ways in which the quintessential academic value of academic freedom is understood not only as protecting controversial ideas, particularly those that might challenge the powerful, which is of course a necessary function, but perversely also as licensed to use racial epithets in the classroom without regard for their impact. But then what after all is the current iteration of the university if it cannot name and freely conjure up that which it is not? Such a possibility signals an existential crisis for the university. And this is precisely why there has been the kind of response and backlash toward black communities who have called to ban to ban the N-word at the university. Therefore, we note that, I, th that ideas that inhere in the university as we have known it, those of intelligence, rationality, reputation, credentializing, exclusivity, prestige, expertise, respectability, Canadianness, academic freedom, and more can only be produced in and through an anti-Black pedagogy. Black people and the scholarly knowledge our lives make possible threaten to undo not only racial ideologies, 
but also dearly and deeply held notions of the reasonable post-racial Canadian state, what it might mean to be a good, respectable Canadian, what it might be to, to be a good, respectable part of the university, and indeed what it might mean to be human in Canada. But if there's promise to the lens I'm using here that names anti-Blackness, it should be clear that it is not to off in order to offer a narrow identity politics. Challenging an anti-Black pedagogy is not something we do for Black students or for Black faculty or for Black people. Using such an analysis of anti-Blackness helps us to understand differently. Challenging an anti-Black pedagogy means addressing representation and also means not stopping at representation. For to stop at representation is to attempt to mindlessly incorporate Black people into a context that exists at our expense. Challenging an anti-Black pedagogy takes issue not only with the exclusion of Black people, but with the logics of exclusion in the first place and the subjectivities formed in, object, in opposition to it. Challenging an anti-Black pedagogy is about pursuing a vision of a different kind of university. Thus, challenging an anti-Black pedagogy cannot be to advance some neutral non-racist pedagogy. It is certainly not an equity, diversity, inclusion pedagogy or an anti-oppression pedagogy, which tend to be nothing more than rehearsals at the university level of the failed multiculturalizing logic that we see operating at the level of the Canadian nation state. Rather, challenging an anti-Black pedagogy is what we might call an abolitionist pedagogy. That is, a pedagogy that envisions and pursues Black freedom and that in so doing dismantles the dehumanizing iterations of the university as we know it. So what does it mean to challenge an anti-Black pedagogy and engage a pedagogy for Black freedom? Big question. And I think you can appreciate the enormity of the task, which is not, however, to make it impossible or to induce paralysis. None of us can do it all, and we cannot do it single-handedly. What I hope to map out here, then, is a broad and incomplete agenda that might offer multiple points of entry and multiple ways forward, multiple ways to get involved in, an, in challenging an anti-Black pedagogy and engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom. You won't be surprised at my first suggestion. Engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom means fostering the conditions on campus and beyond that allow Black people to be safe and to not be presumed a priori to not be of the university. It should be clear that a necessary though not sufficient step toward this end is to immediately abolish police on university campuses and abolish, abolish the logics of policing regardless of who operates by them. For we know that campus security as well as some faculty, staff and students are committed to these logics for the reasons that I have outlined above. If the abolitionist tenet is not already clear, I repeat here that the logics of policing guarantee no one's safety and significantly endanger those of us who are Black, Indigenous, racialized, queer, trans, etc. We need to immediately work to make our campuses police free. We need to immediately work to have universities put resources and labor into developing the anti-carceral, anti-policing mechanisms that might truly promote safety for all of us. Engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom means valuing, taking seriously, and producing Black knowledge. We can do this work at multiple levels, including creating the structures and providing the resources for Black studies as Black studies in universities. We must create Black studies programs 
Black Studies institutes and research centers. And yes, we must create Black Studies departments and faculties. Engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom includes seeking out and addressing the anti-Black logics that frame our academic areas, knowing that they are there to the extent that these areas are forged and developed in the crucible of Western humanistic thought during slavery and its afterlife. Here again, we must not feel that including more Black people in a field is enough. STEM disciplines, that is science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines, need not feel that a pedagogy for Black freedom does not apply to their ostensibly apolitically, apolitical fields. We know better. How then might we, for example, set about the work of reshaping research agendas in these fields to attend to Black life? What is being done in the hard science areas to challenge the ways that these fields have been brought into service of and therefore been shaped by military and surveillance agendas which disproportionately bring about the death of Black, Indigenous, and racialized people? And what work is being done to eradicate the anti-Blackness embedded within the technologies produced by this work? Well-publicized efforts to bring Black people into these fields and have them proportionally represented are therefore necessary, but certainly not enough. And we can see how those can be used as sort of mollifying techniques. And engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom that values Black knowledge includes taking Black objection, Black protest, and Black anger on campus seriously. It means shifting from a logic that views these as threat that must be contained and seeing them rather as an opening to imagine the university differently. And it means ongoing, meaningful consultation with Black communities on all matters that concern us, and certainly in the steps being taken to act on the commitments against anti-Black racism that the institutions and their units have recently made. And this needs to happen without overburdening these Black communities to comment on issues that are others' priorities, but that we have not named as our own priorities. Engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom that values Black knowledge includes understanding the ways in which knowledge is widely distributed, but narrowly validated, to quote Michelle Fine. This means valuing the intellectual work that Black people do daily. It means disabusing ourselves of the sense that we are infallible experts positioned only to teach and not to learn. It means refusing the idea that we are in the business of creating experts. Engaging a pedagogy for Black freedom that values Black knowledge means creating spaces within our units and universities for Black knowledge and thinking, spaces that non-Black people do not always have to be a part of. And certainly, there are classroom-based strategies that align with the pedagogy for Black freedom. These include organizing the classroom space and classroom conversations to invite the knowledge and theory that Black students bring with them, yet to invite it in in ways that do not make them sites of learning from which non-Black students learn cannibalistically. Rather, it means also fostering conversations that offer up non-Black experiences to scrutiny. It might include creating open-ended assignments that allow students to take their work in the directions that make the most sense to them and or to examine the circumstances of their own lives. It might take the form of service projects that seek to dismantle anti-Black arrangements. And of course, it does mean the diverse reading list that brings into the space Black knowledge and Black analyses for contemplation. Yet clearly, none of these classroom strategies is a guarantee. They in fact are useless if they are superimposed where anti-Black structures remain in place unchallenged. They can even easily be co-opted to advance an anti-Black agenda. We are therefore returned to the futility of shallow requests for strategies that do not take into account all else that I have shared. Further, while I have focused on a pedagogy for Black freedom, 
it should be clear that the future we want cannot be won where colonization of indigenous land and the dispossession of indigenous people continues. And to my black folk on the call, let me address us directly. As we speak about the long-term goal of creating the university anew, we must also think about what it means to make black life at the university, even while it continues to be defined by anti-blackness. Engaging a pedagogy for black freedom must be tied to, well, the project of black freedom and liberation. It entails fostering the analyses that help us to create a world where black people can truly be free. To this end, we engage the concept of fugitive study as coined by Harney and Moten. As Jarvis Givens has, write, uh, has written, quote, the pursuit of education in service of transcending black unfreedom has never successfully absolved that suffering, but has more so been a meaningful way of existing in spite of it, end quote. Engaging a pedagogy for black freedom for us means making the opportunities to direct our own fugitive study against the grain of anti-Black pedagogies and against the grain of the anti-Black knowledge we are being asked to learn. Sometimes this will be by making openings within the study we do as part of our programs. It will not be so much about their diverse reading list, but about creating the alternative reading lists that we assign ourselves, always assign ourselves the other reading we are always doing to sustain ourselves and to place ourselves back at the center of our learning. It is also that study which we might do in fugitive spaces we create together for ourselves to contemplate black freedom and make black life. Engaging a pedagogy for black freedom means that in these spaces we will care for each other and make this a priority in the context that wish to do us harm. This means working with those black people who share our politics. And it also means being able to love those who do not. We must be aware of and unsurprised by those who have fallen victim to anti-black post-racial lies that we have all been fed throughout our educational trajectories. So it should be clear that we do not necessarily arrive at university with black political identities fully formed. There can therefore be no sharp ontological distinctions between those who show up already ready to engage in projects of liberation and those who don't yet realize the need to do so. And yet again, those for whom surviving is its own project of liberation and who may not have capacity to do more. Thus a pedagogy for black freedom means holding space for all black persons, for loving blackness even when its expression has been distorted by the educational violence to which it is constantly subject. Understanding this means we make possible a pathway for healing and black self recovery. And if we never see eye to eye, we are big enough to be family, despite our disagreements. And as I speak about fugitive study and fugitive spaces, let me be clear that I do not mean that we run away or that we retreat. The idea of fugitive study as taking the space for black thought and black liberation is intertwined with the idea of simply taking up space at the university. In the face of the structures that negate our presence, let's show up and take up space. Let's fill up the space of our bodies as a research participant once said to me, and then exceed that space. Let us get together and let's represent. Simply having Black people gathering in numbers is contrary to the normative geographies of the university. Let's have Black study groups and Black events and Black student organizations and Black faculty group and groups and Black staff caucuses and Black graduation ceremonies. Let's let Blackness and Black knowledge take up space, jurist generatively spilling over the restrictive boundaries of the time think Black History Month here, and the spaces into which we are normally squeezed. Occupying space too is fugitive learning and Black life making at the university. And as we do so, let's make time for Black joy and Black celebration. And finally, I want to think about our need to resist the problematic discourse focused disproportionately on what it terms Black excellence, which is 
in many ways, an educational form of respectability politics. For me, this certainly does not mean that we should fail to engage in serious and rigorous study, as what I have said thus far should make clear, and as perhaps my students will tell you. Rather, as Lee Patel has wrote, written, it means, quote, unruly rupture from the seductive mollification of school-based achievement, end quote. It means resisting the seduction of the transactional reputation building means of engaging with the university that reproduce our inhumanity. Jarvis Given writes again, quote, the highest calling of black education has been its critical nature, its rootedness in and reflexivity of the space of marginality black people are rele relegated to. In this tradition, Black education has functioned on a shadow curriculum that runs parallel to and as critique of dominant education, its imperialistic aims, assertions of knowledge, and technologies of stratification. It must necessarily be a shadow education, lest we run the risk of becoming that which required our exclusion to begin with." End quote. And to that end today, I encourage us to hear Ashley Woodson, who insists, quote, Black humanity is an ontological reality. We are already enough. With no further recognition, we are already enough. With no new legislation, we are already enough. If there is never another Black first or Black millionaire or Black prodigy, we are already enough enough already. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Dr. Howard, how come you hit me right at the end with that one? I'm going to ask you a question now. <laughs> Thank you so much for that um, encouragement. And as one of your Black folk that you dedicated some of your talk to, I wondered if I could ask you a really hard question for people in this space doing this work. Can I do that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll do my best. All right. So I'm intrigued and very encouraged by this notion of engaging in a pedagogy of Black freedom. Um, and so this is why I'm, I'm asking this question, because every time I do a workshop about um, anti-racism, I receive a kind of email. And I'm going to read you an expert from this kind of email that I receive. And I would love to hear what, uh, what advice you have for me and other people doing this work. So this person talks about the fact that um, even though racism isn't political, um, the method to its resolution certainly is. And this person talks about the fact that they have found that discussing these topics with left-leaning individuals to be too volatile. Um, and and I, I've gotten this, this email many times about um, where the, the person kind of uh, says that there are disturbing and irreconcilable analogs with dogmatic philosophies and the sentiments expressed within anti-racism campaigns. And so I wondered if you had any advice for people like me working in this space. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Great question and big question, as you say. I mean, I, I think one of the ways that I would begin to respond to that is is, is let's set our own agenda. Let's not allow the agenda to be set for us by others, right? Um, I think it's fairly clear that that kind of interruption is the kind of interruption that I spoke about at the beginning. Can we just get on with it? Can you just tell me a couple of little things that we can just do and then we can move on? I'll feel better. I'll feel like I'm a good person. And, you know, of course, I'm not racist kind of idea. And then we'll just move on, right? Um, the work that we do wants to get deeply at the foundations um, of anti-Blackness, right? Um, and as I've argued today, they actually get at the foundations of the university and as, uh, even at humanity as we know it, right? So the project of addressing, um, you know, of, of a pedagogy of Black freedom, as I've called it today, and um, pursuing um, that pedagogy really actually means dismantling all that we know, right? And imagining new ways of engaging. 
And while that is inviting, I don't feel like that serves, I, think, I hope I've made the point that that doesn't only serve black people, right? This is not about an identity politics, right? If we are against the kinds of exclusions that have, have placed black people outside of humanity, then we are against exclusions, period, right? And so we wanna think about a kind of world in which we can all be and live together, right? Um, well, um, and so um, I, I understand that as something that's inviting and it ought to be inviting for most. And I believe that there are many who are, you know, wanting to envision that kind of future together, but there are others who can't imagine their lives and can't imagine their existence beyond what they currently know, right? And they're actually quite happy with the way things are arranged. And if it happens at the expense of a few people, then, you know, so be it, right? Uh, let them not set our agendas, right? Let's, let's do the work that we know he's doing, right? I hope that answers the question. And how you turn that around to be so encouraging. I love that. I love that idea of um, inviting right people to dream with us um, for for a world beyond what we we've known and and have been able to imagine up to this point. So thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Aisha to ask the next question. Dr. Howard, I love how you encourage us to sit with complexity and resist facile solutions. Um, so I have a question from our audience, and I'm going to read it out for you. Mm -hmm. um, given the onto-epistemic depth of anti-Blackness in uh, through the university, how are we to think about the heightened set of EDI initiatives that are being advanced across the university? So how does one begin in engaging EDI whilst understanding it's mainstreaming by the progressive neoliberal university. And I think you touched on this a bit, Dr. Howard, when you anticipated a countercurrent to our dialogue um, that co-ops its language and neutralizes the conversation. Um, but I was wondering what you what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, um, so that's our current struggle, isn't it, right? Um, I, I personally am not very I'm not very hopeful about, about EDI as a concept, right? Because I think that EDI already exists as, and however many other letters we wanna to add to that because we see that happening too, right? Um, and it sort of betrays the kind of multiculturalizing logic that drives it, right? That, you know, we're just going to, um, we're gonna maintain a certain center um, uh, that into which we will invite others, right? And and, and try to welcome others, um, which I don't feel is doing the hard work of engaging um, the kinds of thinking that um, uh, these areas of study, right? That, um, you know, things like black study, like queer studies, gender studies, right? Really want to get at, right? The roots of how we already understand the world, right? It's not, um, I, I see, EDI as being limited to this kind of, you know, let's just welcome everybody and let's let, and let's get along, right? And um, so I struggle. I don't know if I'm forgetting parts of the question here, but I, I, I struggle with this notion and trying to reconcile it with the more radical project that I'm trying to think of that, that, that insists that the status quo is not good enough, that insists that reforming and tweaking what we already have um, is not going to be enough but rather that we need to actually do more. Um, so, you know, and, and we also understand this work, right? If, if, if the on, onto epistemic dimensions that we've talked about um, and that we understand are what they are, we understand that this is work that is going to take time, that this is work that is not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to be fixed it up really easily and, and, and let's just implement um, a few things that will just make it look good. Um, this is going to be ongoing work. And my sense is that, um, you know, and, and, and several of the black scholars have said the same thing recently, right? My sense of course, is that the university um, wants, once we implement the kinds of uh, things that I'm talking about here today will be unrecognizable, right? It, it won't be able to recognize itself as, as what we have now, right? Because it will be so radically different. Thanks, Dr. Howard. I think that does answer the question in terms of at least what is the distinction between EDI discourse as we know, see and hear it in the academy 
um, and the kind of discourse and work that is needed to, to challenge um, anti-Blackness in the academy. I'm gonna pass it back to Melanie Ann for the next question. All right. So I, um, I another question that I always this is easier. Okay, Dr. Howard, again, but I want. <laughs> I love easy questions. <laughs> this one I is hard ones too. So, um, so my passion in life is for graduate students, students in general, but you know, in particular, graduate students, because there's a there's a dual role there that you're also always sitting in this space between the learner, um, and 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 the teacher. So, um, and you know. I am the acting associate director of graduate programs at the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I've got an amazingly bold team when we are always pushing the envelope in terms of what we can teach our graduate students and, and also our postdoctoral scholars, but what they can do in the classroom. Um, and then, you know, reality hits. And so many of our graduate students will say to us, you know, I, what a great idea, but how can I do that in, in a classroom that isn't just my own, right? Because I am the TA or I am a new graduate instructor. And I wondered if you had any advice for graduate students who, who are with you, who want to dream with you, who, who know, who've done their homework, um, but, but don't have the power to really enact the kind of change that they want to see in their classrooms because they are limited in in, in their roles as TAs or new graduate instructors? That's a great question, right? And I could start by saying um, we find and we take and we make the spaces that we can, right? This is how we've always done the work, right? Um, doors aren't like thrown open for us and said, you know, to say, come in and do that radical work. Like, just, just tear up what I'm doing here, right? You know, the, we don't get those kinds of invitations, right? So it is that work of, of figuring out, well, what space do I have? Where do I have an opening? What can I do? What is under my sort of um, jurisdiction to do, right? What can I um, implement? under these circumstances, right? And I think there's a very real calculation that also needs to be done about, you know, what's realistic in this space. Um, but I also want to say that this, if we're going to limit our strategies um, and our work to what we can do within these formal spaces, then yes, that, that vision is always going to be truncated, which is why I've talked about these, these other spaces, right? These fugitive spaces that we create um, where we can do this kind of work. And often when we actually do get into these spaces, I mean, you know, I don't want to just be a talking head here who supposedly has all the answers. I, I, I want us to engage modesty and to understand that we learn from our own every day, right? But one of the things that we do is create these spaces. So what does it look like if we create spaces for graduate students in particularly in, in these very same circumstances where you can strategize together and share ideas and think about, well, what have you done that I might be able to do, right? And then how do we take this work outside of that formal space, right? And, um, and, engage, and engage in it otherwise and in elsewhere spaces. Right. I think think both things have to happen at the same time. So I understand the struggle, right? And it's not only for TAs and graduate students, right? At each, at all levels, right? As faculty, there's limits that to what I can do. Um, there's lots of things I'd like to do, um, but you know, particularly when we're pre-tenure, as I am at this moment, right? <laughs> all kinds of limitations there too, right? Um, and needing to think about that. So um, this is this is the ongoing struggle. Um, and let's just find the spaces where we can uh, learn together um, and not limit our work just to what happens in the formal space, regardless of the level of, of control we have over it. Brilliant answer, Dr. Howard. I'll hand it back over to Aisha for the next one. Okay, Dr. Howard, the questions are coming in fast and furious, and I wish we could uh, keep you here all day, uh, but don't worry, we won't. <laughs> so here's, here's another question from a participant who is identifying as a white settler um, and wondering if you could speak more about working in the classroom toward both a, a pedagogy of Black freedom and a decolonial pedagogy. Um, and they're particularly interested as an instructor in ensuring that they're able to address both issues fulsomely without collapsing the two um, and recognize that this is a, a huge task and a huge question. 
Right, it is a huge question and it's an excellent one. Um, and I think that the seeds of the answer are, are already in the question. Um, <clears throat> I, I hope to have made clear today that there is no way that, um, that we can consider a project of black freedom that is not also de decolonial, right? And vice versa, right? We can't think about a decolonial project that is not anti-black and um, that, that, that um, produces or allows the continuance of anti-blackness, right? Um, and so while these two projects are not, you know, collapsible into each other, right? And while, it, while they need to be pursued differently and at different times in different ways and come together in different ways, right? I'm not trying to suggest that they are, you know, the same struggle because they aren't. Um, and, and we have to be able to embrace moments of incommensurability, right? Um, we can't lose sight of the fact that these two things need to occur together, right? Um, and I think the question is based in what I hear the question coming out of is, um, is a framing, that, not that I'm suggesting the questioner has this framing, but it is, it is very much you know, sort of informed by a kind of framing that always wants to set these things in opposition, right? Like what we do for Black people or what we do about Black freedom, you know, um, is taken away from what we can do for decolonization. And I think those that are involved in a pedagogy of Black freedom that are evolved in abolitionist um, work um, and those who are involved deeply in, in decolonial work, right? And um, th that kind of work have already made really clear that these two projects, these projects are not in opposition, right? That we're pursuing them together and that we're working with them together. Um, as to the nuts and bolts and exactly how it's done, of course, again, do I have all the answers here that, you know, to say, here's what we do tomorrow? No, but I do think that there is um, an approach and a, um, a way in which that we can approach this that always already refuses to see them as oppositional and refuses to see them as um, unable to both happen, right? When we imagine the world that we want, it must be a world, right? Where there is black freedom, but it also must be a world that, um, that, is, that is decolonized. Absolutely. Oh, did you want me to go next or did you have another one, Aisha? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I wondered, uh, this is something that one of our panel or one of our guests asked as well, and I was I was wondering about this as I was listening to your talk, Dr. Howard, about whether you see different roles for um, people who are Black academics, people who are Black community members, for example, Black students um, and allies in terms of engaging with this pedagogy of Black freedom or not. I'm wondering what you think about that. I mean, I think kind of we're we're obviously positioned differently, right? So um, I don't want to prescribe roles in advance, like you know, we're going to do this and you do this while I do that kind of thing, right? But I do think that the ways that we are positioned, um, you know, black or not, um, makes a difference in the kind of work that we can do, right? And what what kinds of groups we'll be part of, and what kinds of conversations we can be a part of what kinds of conversations we can accept that, you know, I won't be a part of that conversation, right? Because there needs to be a space for that conversation to happen on its own, right? Without my intervention. And it's, it's okay for me to not be there. I can deal with the FOMO, right? For a little while there, right? Um, I, think, um, I think also if we can think differently about the work, not as maybe allyship, right? Which, which tends to, tends to engage this idea that, you know, again, I'm coming in to help you with your stuff, right? But let's think differently about, is this the world and the future that we want, right? What's at stake for me, even as a non-Black person, if this world doesn't come about? Do I care about that, right? If we don't produce this future, you know, am I okay to keep living in this particular space, right? So then it shifts the kind of um, ways we think about the work that we do together, right? And then we, we might speak more in terms of, um, you know, a, a term that's sort of rising now, but really captures the kind of work we can do together. Um, being a co-conspirator, 
rather than an ally, right? How can we conspire together to dismantle the world that we know it, that we know is evil and violent to black people, but because of its logics is evil and violent to everyone, right? And build a new kind of future. And what's at stake for each of us in that kind of work? Dr. Howard, one of the things I really appreciate about the way you talk about this is that you have such a sense of connectedness um, you know, to the land, right, to to other people, right, to our, our shared humanity. And I and I find that a lot, you're inspiring me by what you're saying and the way you're saying it. Oh, pedagogy, because you are, because you, a lot of, of critiques are always about, you know, like, aren't we forcing, you know, Black people and, and the issues of Black people and more into silos or, or segregating ourselves. But but you are doing this work recognizing, right, that none of us are colorblind and at the same time recognizing our connectedness and shared humanity and 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 asking each of us individually to recognize our, 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 our identities and our positions of, of power and marginalization and, and our goals, right, for how we want to, to live together um, in this world. So, so I'm just, I'm just loving the way that you are answering these questions because it is a perspective um, that I think a lot of people have, but I've never heard it articulated so beautifully. So I'll hand it over to Aisha for the last question. Okay, this is, it's really hard picking a final question, um, but here's, there's one about task forces. Uh, and their presence on university campuses right now. And the question is around what can we do to make task forces on EDI, anti-racism, et cetera, uh, meaningful and radical sites of disruption um, to actually dismantle um, the structures that we need to dismantle. Yeah, I feel like I would need to know <laughs> a lot more about you know, what task force, whose agenda, who's setting the agenda, who's a part of this task force, um, who's helping to set the vision for what it's trying to do, right? Is it aligned with a kind of uh, reformist strategy that won't really change much, right? That will sort of, um, you know, neutralize the imperative for change? Um, or is it the kind of task force that is that is really, you know, about setting about doing the work. Again, uh, you know, I don't know that the answer is different for a task force than it is for the classroom. I don't know that the answer is different um, for a task force than it is for any other space that we're doing this work, right? It's all about figuring out what, what it is, what is that future that we want? What are we working towards? And are we working towards it together? Um, I don't, I don't know that a lot of institutions are actually prepared to make the kind of change that we want. So while I'm not trying to be pessimistic, I also want to say that um, we should perhaps just be modest in our expectations about what task, for, task forces and other kinds of institutional initiatives might bring about. Right, and let's be, uh, freedom has never been given to black folk. Black folk have always taken it, right? And so the dependence on, you know, new policies and um, task forces and all the rest of that, as much as those things are in some ways welcome, right? And, and feel like sometimes moving in the right direction. Let's not get, let's not get it twisted as they say, right? where we think that the work will be done for us in those, in those spaces, right? Um, there's work that we're going to have to continue to do outside of those contexts, right? And there's work that we're going to have to do in terms of holding those contexts to account so that they actually produce um, the kinds of results that we want. And so, you know, it, it's an ongoing struggle, right? Uh, if, if seeing, strategies against anti-black racism or you know task forces and those kinds of things right are not sort of the goal the goal is that end it's that vision that we want right and so how do we continue to do the work as black people and as our co-conspirators together to ensure and to hold that work to account and make it happen and then not put all our eggs into that basket 
but also be ready to continue the work that always needs to happen outside of, alongside, beyond the institution. Dr. Howard, that's a powerful message to end on. And I have to say one of the things I appreciate the most about this morning is the way that you helped me reframe and reconceptualize even the very questions that we're asking at our institutions. And to me, that's really powerful. Um, so thank you so much for spending this time with us. I hope this is the start of one of many conversations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me.